Um, I want to tell you this, uh, well, at this point, I think it's almost like a folk tale. And I really wanted to tell you this story because it took place here in Melbourne. And it's about one of your own. So I figured this is the place to tell this story. Uh, the time we came out here to do the Livid Festival in no November 95, a couple of weeks before we came out here, I was in Los Angeles, and I got a phone call from a local TV crew from here. I, I don't know the, the channel, uh, I forget the channel, but I got this call, and they said, um, we saw that you're coming to Melbourne very soon, and um, we've been covering the case of this young man named Marius Bannister, who's at the local hospital here, and he's, he's battling leukemia. And he's been on our channel a few times, and uh, we're covering him and rooting for him. And uh, recently, we asked him, uh, you know, make a wish or, you know, tell, say five things you want. And he talked about how cool it would be if he could meet you. And we're wondering if you could take time out of your very busy schedule to go to the hospital and meet Marius. You know, maybe sign a photo or, or to, you know, shake his hand or give him a T-shirt or something. I said, man, I am there. Gave him my manager's phone number. I said, here's the man to call, set it up, I will be there. Not knowing at all what I was going to say to this guy, but absolutely refusing not to do it. I mean, I, how, how are you not going to do it? How are you too busy to have time to hang out with a 17-year-old boy battling leukemia? I said, I'm, I, I will be there. And I immediately got really nervous after I hung up the phone. I'm like, oh my God, man. Whew. That's really heavy. I've never done anything like that before. So weeks go by. We play next door at the palace. And the next day is a day off. And the TV guys come to the hotel. And they said, OK, here we go. And I went down to this hospital. They go up the, es the elevator. And I'm standing outside of Marius's door with the head nurse and Marius's grandmother. And the nurse says, here, you got to wash your hands. And she produces this like you know, this container of this like yellow green liquid and I dunk my hands in, I'm scrubbing up. I'm like, why am I doing this? She said, well, um, Marius is going through chemotherapy and the germs on your hands can infect him because his resistance is down. That's what chemotherapy does. I'm like, right, I know that. So I'm scrubbing my hands up and she says, um, I don't think he knows you're in town today. I don't think he's expecting any visitors. So this will be a bit of a surprise. My stomach just turns into a knot. I was nervous already. I'm like, oh man. Okay, and she goes, are you ready? I'm like, yeah, I guess. And uh, I'm, I'm getting all jittery. And she knocks on the door and opens it and says, Marius, are you awake? And I hear this voice go, yes. Um, you have a visitor, can he come in? And I hear this voice go, okay. She opens the door and said, go meet Marius. I'm like, oh boy. I walk in, I make a left, and I see this boy sitting on a bed, no hair, and these tubes coming out of him. And he sees me, and I see him, and he sits up, his eyes go wide, he looks at me and says, Fuck! <laughs> and I'm looking at this guy, and the nurse had told me before I went in there, she said, you know, the chemotherapy has made, uh, you know, the inside of his mouth ulcerate a little, so he may bleed a little when he talks to you, and he doesn't have any hair, so he looks a little little beat up, but don't worry, you know, you can handle it. I'm like, okay. And sure enough, Marius had no hair and his lips were kind of dry, you know, and I'm like, whoa, what an intense looking guy. And the one thing I couldn't do was lie. I didn't know what I was going to talk to him about or say to him, but I knew I couldn't lie because someone in that position, they can read bullshit like, like that fast. And so I just kind of looked at him and he went, you know, fuck. And I went, how you doing, Marius? My name is Henry Rollins. Heard you needed to talk to me. So he could think, when Marius Bannister needs something. <laughs> Hank Rollins flies 14 hours when he hears the call, goddammit. <laughs> Sat down on the edge of his bed, shook his hand, looked around the room thinking, okay, where do I go from here? And all I could do is tell the truth. I looked around the room and went, Marius, this room is fucked. And I was hoping he would laugh and not go, why are you telling and he was so brave. He goes, yeah, I hate this place. And we both started laughing because the room is really dingy and the curtains are drawn and the place is tiny and the bed takes up most of the space and it, it sucked. And I went, oh man, this place is the worst. He goes, I hate this place, man. I hate it. And he's laughing. I'm laughing. You know, I'm like digging this guy immediately. And so I go, so what's a day in this place like? And he goes, well, you know, everyone comes to visit me, friends from school, grandma, mom, you know, nurses, 
nuns, everybody comes in here and they read to me and they give me a cool towel for my head and everyone's great to me and I try and be in a good mood when they're here so they're, they feel okay. But when visiting hours are over, they leave and I spend the night by myself and it's hard for me to sleep. I said, why? He said, because if I'm gonna die, I wanna die with my eyes open. I don't wanna die when I'm asleep. I have never had anybody in my life say anything that intense to me ever, especially coming out of the mouth of a 17-year-old. And you guys, you know how we are. We say all kinds of tough macho shit all the time. Honey, I wanna die with my boots on. That's the kind of guy I am. Here's this 17-year-old kid, you know, obviously pretty shook up that he's in this hospital looking at me saying, if I'm gonna die, I wanna die while I'm awake. I'm not gonna die when I'm asleep. Man, that was so intense. I realized immediately, he's the teacher, I'm the student, he's the mountain, I'm the molehill. And I'm sitting at the foot of his bed like, oh no, where do we go from here? I wanna start asking him advice. He marries, I can't get laid, what do I do? <laughs> you know, I'm an aging alternative icon. Where can I go from here? Help me, Marius. So I'm looking around the room, you know, looking for something to talk, to talk about. And I see all these photos of bands against the wall taped up there. And the biggest one I can see with my bad eyesight is the picture of the Beastie Boys taken from some magazine. And I go, the Beastie Boys! And he's like, yeah? Looking at me like I'm nuts, because all of a sudden I, was, I just ejaculated, the Beastie Boys, out of nowhere. He thinks I'm a Looney Tune. I go, I know them, hoping he won't say, so? Hoping he'll go, really? And he said, you do? I went, yeah. They're my favorite band. And the poor guy immediately had to qualify it. But you guys are cool. I said, don't worry about it, man. It's okay to have a favorite band that I'm not in. You know, it's, not, it's okay, but you know, it's cool. Not that okay, but we'll tolerate it. And he goes, man, those guys are so great. I go, yeah, they are great. He goes, you know them? I go, oh yeah. Wow, I said, I've toured with them. You've toured with them? I said, yeah. So I told him like these tour stories about going out with the Beastie Boys and, and how cool they are, because they are really cool people. One of the e easiest tours ever, because they're all smart, they're all funny, and when they hit stage, they kick some huge ass nightly. And I would watch them almost every night. I'd play, shower off, eat some food, and get right on the side of the stage and stand next to their monitor man and just get into it. And it was the funnest. And I'm telling him stories and I'm making him laugh, because we had uh, Cypress Hill on this tour as well. So it was a hell of a bill. And every night Cypress would open, then we'd play, and then the Beastie Boys would, you know, kick it. And uh, watching Cypress Hill every night is just amazing, because that guy, B-Real, is just the man. That voice, his whole thing. Like halfway through their set, like the, the, uh, the plug in the dat player would come loose, and the, 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 the set would come to a, an immediate halt. You know, Duke, Duke, Duke. And most bands were like, oh no. You know, a band like us, oh, nothing's wrong. Nothing's wrong, you know, we'd be faking it. The, their thing is, you know, the DJ, two microphones, and a DAT machine. It's a very simple setup, so when one thing goes wrong, it's very apparent, because there's only like five working things on stage. And so the DAT machine goes off, and the music goes away, and there's silence on stage. And instead of going like, you know, you're fired, you're fired, you're fired, B-Real just comes to the other and says, guess what, y'all? What? We fucked up. <gasps> The crowd loves him for this. He has them in the palm of his hand. I want y'all to say, Cypress Hill, y'all fucked up. Cypress Hill, y'all fucked up. All right, I think we got this shit plugged in. All right. And they go right back into it, and they just kill everyone. They're amazing. And so I'm, I'm cracking up Marius, and I'm telling him these stories, and I'm putting a smile on, my, on his face, which I imagine is my job, you know, to, cheer the guy up because he's sitting in this room all day and you know I want to break him out of that for a minute and make him forget it for a second and have a laugh on me and so I'm telling him these stories as many stories as I can think of and I'm giving him some shit because he missed the show the night before and I thought we played pretty good I go so where were you last night in bed right he's like yeah I said, you didn't come to the show what's the matter with you you don't like me and he's like no man look at me come on I got tubes coming out of me I'm like that's eh, really not much of an excuse you know, we're playing here in about a year. You will be on the guest list for the show. You're showing up, right? He's like, oh, yeah, I swear to God, I'll be there. I said, okay, because I didn't see you last night. And next time you don't show up, I'm just going to come and kick your ass. You know, I'll kick your ass in front of your friends. It'll be really embarrassing for you. And he's like, no, man, I swear to God, I'm going to make it. I said, that's good, that's good. Don't make me, don't make me come over there. And so 
we talked a while longer and then I kind of ran out of steam because the intensity of this room is a lot to deal with. The specter of imminent death leans over the two of us. I mean, leukemia is a tough one to beat. And the, the young man has got a good chance, but man, there's a good chance you're not gonna come out of there too. And I'm very aware of that, that I'm sitting in the room with a very brave 17-year-old guy with more balls than I will ever possess, put up against an adversary I have not ever been anywhere near matched up to. And he's just pulling it off with this amazing flintiness and he's got humor and he's got a lot of class and he's a sharp guy and I'm like sitting there knowing I'm outmatched by a 17 year old and I'm like damn this is a stone cold honor hanging out with this guy but the death thing is there I mean that's why he's in this room they're trying to keep him alive it's not like he has a cold or something it's fucking leukemia man and so I kind of ran out of steam I was like ah. Uh, I kind of sagged to one side, and he being the stronger of the two of us, he helped me out. He said, Henry, um, you know, I appreciate you coming by, but you know, I got some stuff I need to do pretty soon, so I gotta, I'm like, yeah, you know, me too, I got stuff I gotta do, you got stuff you gotta do, we're both guys with a lot of stuff to do, and um, I said, okay, so well, I'll leave you to it, and uh, the nurse came in and took a photo of us, and we shook hands, and we exchanged addresses, I said, okay, Marius, now that I got your address, you know I know how to come over to your house and kick your ass if you don't show up to my gig next time. I said, you got to get out of this place, Marius. Fuck leukemia. You're way stronger than leukemia. I know you're going to beat this. Do you know you're going to beat this? He goes, absolutely. I go, we're betting on that. So we bet on it. I said, I'll see you next time. Absolutely. He goes, that's right. I said, okay, Marius. And I walked out of there. And his grandmother was there. She's in, she's all, oh, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. I'm like, I'll oh, save it. You know, I got time for this. It's okay. And I walked around. St. Kilda for the rest of the afternoon just tripping on this guy on, and his bravery and not with a sentiment of oh I love life and every day is a blessing you know but it is but I'm just thinking what an extraordinary circumstance transforms an average 17 year old kid who has an interest in in judo and and surfing and his friends and all youthful 17 year old boy pursuits what transforms a guy like this from the average student boy in Australia to this amazing, charismatic guy staring at a pretty intense reality? And it, it's a horrible circumstance that makes you or breaks you. And it's interesting to be around someone who's on the, riding the wave of sheer terror and getting a tan. I mean, the guy is amazing. And so I just thought about him the whole time I was here, got back to America a few days later, did a bunch of university speaking dates and I was talking about this guy I just met named Marius Bannister going, man, coolest guy I met this year. And I'm like, whoa, what a man. And um, a couple of months later, I get a letter from Marius' mother in the mail and it's a card with a letter inside it. And the card has a picture of Marius in his schoolboy outfit. And uh, I was looking at it going, ah, Marius, check out that tie and that cap. That Australian schoolboy outfit's hilarious, you know? <laughs> It's what makes Australian men so intense. They spend their youth growing up in hot pants. <laughs> and by the time they're in their late teens, they're just, they're really aggro. <laughs> Looking at my pants, mate, bam, they're just tough. It's those pants that makes you tough. All that, you know, kidding around the schoolyard. So anyway, looking at Marius with his, his tie on and everything, and it says underneath his photo, you know, Marius Bannister, born into eternity, and had some date where Marius died. He died a little while after I visited him. And then uh, I open up the letter and it's from his mother. And she said, thank you for meeting my son. Um, I don't know what you all talked about, but you certainly gave him a lot to ponder. And he, he really liked meeting you. And it was, thank you so much. We know you're a busy guy and you're on tour and we can't believe you took the time and made the time. And I don't know what people think I'm doing on these tours. I mean, yeah, I'm busy. Aren't you busy? We're all busy, but there's certain things that are priority. And, um, she said, you know, thank you very much. Can't tell you how much it meant to us that you came and did this. So I wrote her a letter back and I uh, said, um, just so you know, I met your son for an hour and I'm never going to forget him as long as I live. I was honored. And you hung out with him for 17 years. So you have to consider yourself really lucky because you got 17 years with him. I only got an hour and I feel lucky. You must feel like the luckiest woman in the world. And I left it at that and I sent it away and... Uh, you know, never forgot the guy. And uh, I wanted to tell you that story because we're in his town. And um, last time I was here, down the next, next door playing a show, we dedicated a song to him. 
And I met some of his uh, friends after the show that came up and they said, yeah, we're in his class. That was cool that you did that. Thanks a lot. And um, you, you know, one of your, your many local heroes, you know, you, so you got another one that you know about that you might not have known about when you walked in here. His name is Marius Bannister. Don't ever forget him.